welcome to the Mind Money Spectrum podcast, where your hosts, Aaron Ogti and Trisha Patel, go beyond traditional finance questions to help you explore how to use your money to achieve the freedom you want in life. In this episode, Trishal and Aaron explore investing as a hobby. Trishal, the former hedge fund manager, calls it the world's most expensive hobby, while Aaron, the financial planner, can see why some people have fun with it, as long as you aren't risking money needed for long-term goals, and you can stomach the losses, and understand the opportunity cost. In the end, maybe most people shouldn't be buying stocks for fun? And now, on to our conversation. Welcome to our podcast, everybody, and... This week, we'll be exploring investing as a hobby. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and I hope you're all well out there. But before we begin, let me introduce myself. My name is Trisha Patel, and I'm a wealth manager on the East Coast. And with me today is my co-host, Aaron Ogti. Aaron is a financial planner out on the Bay Area in the West Coast. Thank you very much, Trisha. It's nice talking to you today. Great. Well, so in this episode, I'm going to kick things off talking about my thoughts on investing as a hobby and the perspective I bring to the table. And then I'm going to turn it over to Aaron to see what he thinks. So let's kind of get into this. At a high level, hobbies are great. We all know that. And they're useful for finding activities outside of work. And naturally, over anybody's career, they're going to be gathering some sort of wealth. And sooner or later, they'll need to allocate that wealth. And that's where investing comes into play. So then the question comes down to how active should an individual be in pursuing their investments? Meaning what types of decisions should they be making? And how do those types of decisions impact their long-term goals and plans? The way this ties into investing as a hobby is that basically... If you're going to be investing, is it something you do on your free time where you want to kind of outsmart the market and make an extra return or even just have some fun? Or is it something where you follow a more backseat approach where you either outsource your investment strategy to a professional or you follow what's known as a more passive approach where you kind of set it and forget it with a certain selection of long term? assets. Let's see how that fits into one perspective, and then I'll turn it over to Aaron for his view. From my standpoint, I think investing as a hobby is probably the worst mistake an individual could make. It's probably the most expensive hobby out there. The reason I say this is if an individual were to invest as a hobby, they're likely pursue this in their free time outside of the normal career. And their goal is to basically make more money than they would from a alternative strategy. And what I want to dig into from my perspective is that when retail investors try to do this, they end up, in fact, underperforming and they end up giving up losses over time. And We'll talk about this in a bit more detail as a podcast progresses, but these losses can be pretty significant and lead to costly, not only mistakes, but costly opportunities where an individual may have to even change their retirement plans just because they did not invest as well as they could have. So, so that's my perspective, and I'm going to turn it over to Aaron. Aaron, what do you think of that? So... I both agree with you and disagree with you. Perfect. And the reason I disagree with you is that I, I don't think it is the worst thing. I, I agree with the idea that you shouldn't be investing as a hobby for your retirement. And so I think there's a difference between an appropriate investment strategy for some long-term goal and buying stocks for fun. So I agree with you on the idea that you shouldn't be risking retirement dollars or, retire, or money for your children's education or a down payment on a house. You shouldn't be kind of risking the lifestyle and those goals by buying stocks for fun. 
But if you know that you're on track and you're going to save enough and have a good investment strategy for those goals, whether it's working with a professional or a passive ETS strategy, either of those could work. With the money on top of that, buying stocks can be fun. And I remember in 2008 when the market was crashing and I was randomly paying attention to Bank of America. I think the stock price for Bank of America got down right around a dollar. I don't remember if it went specifically below one dollar. That's a double check, but it was within the scale of a few pennies above or below one dollar. I remember thinking at the time, that seems abnormally low. Like th there's some additional panic. If you just look at anything related to how much money Bank of America makes, there's no way that it should have a stock price of one dollar. And at the time, I was a few years out of college. I had just bought a house. I was I knew I was saving enough for retirement into 401k. So I didn't have any extra money to put into Bank of America. But I remember thinking at that time that you'd almost apply just a little bit of common sense of this is way too low. I wish I had some money lying around to buy this. And over the next few years, it, it actually came out to be, to be true. Everything came back up. If you just, every stock market, every stock in the market came back up except for Lehman Brothers. So as long as you kind of found that low, didn't matter if you packed the perfect low, but you could have seen that this is too low and then ridden up. And I've seen it a few other times. Uh, I have uh, looked at Apple stock when it has some of these big swings up and down. And every, every now and then I think, oh, I, this feels wrong. I probably could look at would this stock go back up? And I've noticed, I, I have not personally done that because I tend to be more long-term goal-oriented, but I've had conversations with others and it's just the idea that if you have the extra money, if it's not for a goal, then like you said, it could be an interesting hobby. You, you actually get some of the psychology that's similar to almost betting that it, it can be fun to look at the stock market, look at individual stocks and participate in that. And it's much, much better odds than gambling that you're, even if you picked any stock, you're more likely to go up than go down. You probably will not go up as much as a professional money manager because it's their job to generate rate of return on investments and you're doing and you're doing it just for fun with a few extra hours, whereas they're doing it as if their livelihood depends on it. So I, that's why I say I, I agree and disagree that you are more likely to underperform. And if your retirement depends on it, it's going to be probably too expensive and you're probably going to make mistakes. But if you're doing it for fun, then it might be okay. If you have that money set aside and you don't need to outperform the professional money manager. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are on if you have a good strategy for the goals already in place, and then it truly is a hobby, and then you've referred to it as the world's most expensive hobby, I think that's, that's your phrase. How do you feel about it from that perspective? I think you made a lot of good points along the way, especially the notion that you probably shouldn't do this with your entire portfolio, a small portion of your portfolio that you could set aside for this particular hobby might make sense. I, I see that, but I think I, I see a few concerns with that line of thinking as well. The, the first thing that kind of stands out to me is, and, and you made this analogy, if you're doing it as a hobby, how similar is that to gambling per se? The notion is you're trying to play a game of skill. It's not purely luck-based like blackjack, but maybe it's more like poker. 
or it's not like roulette entirely, but maybe it's like Hold'em, where maybe it's possible to have an edge. And then the notion is, okay, m maybe this type of hobby might be worth it for a small percent. And if it's like gambling, here are the two concerns I see. One is there might be the tendency to expand one scope beyond a small percent of their overall portfolio. Let's say an indiv individual has some early wins. You know, this kind of happens. We've all heard about that person who said, oh, I, you know, I saw this and the stars looked right and I bought the stock and look at it now. And they kind of use that as the anchor for all of their future trading. Mm. But what they don't really keep an eye on is all the other mistakes. In fact, most gamblers like to mention that big win, but we all know there might have been lots of little losses along the way. It's a negative expectation. But, you know, as you mentioned, stock markets tend to go up. So you have a positive expectation there. But my second point is I'd push back on that as well. If you think about it, yes, you can make money in stocks because stocks tend to go up. However, we have to think about what money is. The money is being put to work for future use, and there's an opportunity cost for moving away from a particular benchmark. So let's say, for example, your benchmark is the S&P and you choose to invest in a stock like IBM. If IBM does better than the S&P, you beat your benchmark. If it does worse, then you've tailed your benchmark. But in both cases, IBM could be up. up. You could have made money. So the concern I see is that you could very well make money unlike a gambler who loses money, but you could still leave money on the table. You could still fall behind your benchmark. In fact, I think the evidence suggests that you're far more likely to fall behind than move ahead. There's a few things that might point us in that direction. One is you look at actual professionals and you see how their performance is. There's a lot of research on how professionals do over time. And the high level notion is active management has become harder and harder. In fact, it's harder to do this professionally. In fact, there's a paper out there that talks about this particular notion. It's called False Discoveries in Mutual Fund Performance, and it was published in 2010 in the Journal of Finance. And it talked about this notion of skill. And it looked at the skill of active managers and it tried to discern, are active managers actually lucky or are they bringing skill to the table? Here's what I mean by this. If you go to a casino, some people will win, right? They just kind of have to. But does it mean they're actually skillful or did they just get lucky? The same is true with mutual funds, for example. Some mutual funds just have to outperform because that's how rolling the dice works in the markets. So you're talking about like a, a, just a standard deviation or a normal distribution where some, to have an average, some people have to be above average and some people have to be below average. Exactly. And, and that's what happens with mutual funds. But if you're really skillful, you would be even outside that normal distribution, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You would go above and beyond what um, would be predicted by just a standard normal distribution if you're skillful. And here's what that research said. The research said, if you go back earlier in the data set, if you go back to the 70s and 80s, there were actually a lot of skillful managers. You saw 15% of managers providing skill beyond luck alone, meaning they were adding value to the table. But over time, if you look at the later part of the data set, all of that skill got wiped away, meaning the managers that are doing better could not be explained beyond just luck alone. So if you have a situation where professionals, they're spending every waking moment of their life trying to figure out, should I buy IBM or not? And they're not able to outperform that benchmark. What luck does a retail investor have? Okay, so I, I do kind of agree with that, that 
if an individual investor was to outperform a professional, it is much more likely to come from either concentration risk or short-term randomness. And concentration risk just be the idea that the money managers are going to invest in dozens or hundreds of stocks or investments. And so they're going to be closer to a diversified portfolio and therefore closer to a benchmark. Whereas if you just pick a few stocks, your range of possibilities is so much bigger that you could outperform because you picked that one stock that did outperform the benchmark. So, and then randomness is just even the best investors in the world, even Warren Buffett will see that he'll underperform benchmarks in random quarters or even years, but given a long enough track record and a long enough time frame, he has outperformed. Although, as you said, it might be that his outperformance was generated mostly in the 70s and 80s, and it's possible that he is not outperforming by as much uh, in the last decade or two. So, so there is that idea that you it's unlikely to expect as an individual investor to outperform a money manager because even money managers can't perform outperform other money managers. But my question to you then is, I guess it's one idea that no one buys bonds for fun. Everyone buys stocks for fun. And, and so I think a professional money manager will put together a good asset allocation and they'll include a decent chunk of bonds in that portfolio, depending on the risk profile and what they're trying to accomplish. But why do people buy stocks for fun? And if they are not putting their retirement at risk, would you have any advice for them? If they're okay with the idea that they might underperform, and that's the cost of their hobby, what advice would you provide to those people? So we've already gotten individuals past the idea that they can't risk their retirement and they're probably going to underperform a money manager. So there is good, whatever that opportunity cost is how much their, their hobby is going to cost them. So what advice would you have for them? Here's what a retail investor is competing with. Here's what you probably need to do to remain competitive in picking stocks. The first thing you could do is absolutely nothing. You can throw darts at a newspaper and you'll probably do better than most professionals on a gross basis. So that, that's the first thing you can do. Purely make it a gamble. But the second thing you can do is try to do what the professionals do. What they do is, let's say they're doing stock picking. There's a few different notions. You can do something called technical analysis, where you're looking at the stock price on a chart and looking for trends, like has it been moving up very quickly compared to its history? And has it hit a peak or a trough or something like that? So you can do that. There's little evidence to back it up, but that could still be fun. And you could alternatively do something called a fundamental analysis. With this line of research, what you'd be doing is you'd be trying to learn everything about the company itself to make a decision on whether you should buy it or not, including its price, meaning is it a good value? There are two schools of thought on this. One is called bottoms up and the other is called top down. So bottoms up, you start from the very nitty gritty details of the stock and you try to formulate an opinion looking at all the little things you possibly can and you figure out whether it's a good buy or not. And then top down, you start at the high level. You look at broad economic trends. Where is GDP going? Where is unemployment going? And how does this affect a particular sector or industry? And then you look at the entire industry and you figure out what's the best players in that industry. And then you look at those companies and you compare them against each other in terms of competitors. And you, you see where the market for that industry is going. And then you pick the top stock in there and so on. 
but in the fundamental side, what that really requires is you need to know these companies inside and out. You need to be on top of every single news article that comes out if you want to be successful. Because b believe it or not, there's algorithms out there that are going to do that and beat you to the punch every second of the day. Meaning, if that CEO you know, has a headache and he ends up in the hospital, you might want to react to that because the computer algos will certainly do so. They'll be able to interpret that information and come up with a model that refines how much that stock will move and immediately trade on it. Also, you'll need to keep track of all of the quarterly and annual statements that come out for the stock and digest them and reflect on how that might affect the earnings on a go forward basis. You'll want to talk to clients of that stock and competitors of the stock, and you'll want to understand the industry that that stock plays in. So there's a lot to do if you want to do it from a professional standpoint. And again, there's two ways that I mentioned. You can do nothing or you can do everything, but it turns out that both don't really seem to lead to outperformance. Okay, so... I, again, I, I agree with what you say. Everything you, I think everything you said is technically true and accurate, but I disagree completely. And what I mean by that is that, that those are good, solid methods for a money manager. And I don't think it's reasonable for any individual investor to apply the same methods and beat the people who's livelihoods depend on it again that's like this is what they do for a living and if they don't do it well they get fired so i my recommendation is kind of actually is to go completely opposite you need to come up with something completely different from any other money manager and so one of the things i just kind of see and this this played out with netflix a decent amount where understanding st stocks are ownership in a company. People buy stocks because of the significant upside potential where uh, they don't buy bonds because they don't want to get a few percentage points in a coupon that they are only looking for those home runs kind of thing. That's the fun part of it. And so to really get those big home runs, understanding that a company so because a, a stock is a small percentage of ownership if they're either yielding a dividend so they're paying out percentage of profits to its owners or they are reinvesting that and you're seeing stock owners make money by through the appreciation of the stock price the stock price is going up because the company is now making more money even if they're not yielding a dividend and so you need to look for companies that will make more money in the future than they are now. So if a company's financials went, were exactly the same, so this is a mature company, so not a growth company, but a mature company yielding a dividend, if their financials were exactly the same from one year to the next, you would expect the stock price to be the same and you are making the same amount of money on that dividend. You might lose a little bit to inflation, but, but it's the idea that if the, the company's financials stay the same, the stock price stays the same, and there's a dividend that also stays the same. You made a little bit of money, but it's not growth. For growth, it's the company has to make more money and possibly significantly more money in the future than it will now. And so you, if you're going to kind of do this for fun again, my thoughts are that look for companies or stocks that for some reason or another could do much better in the future than they are now. And with Netflix, it just came from the idea that I was watching shows on Netflix and I knew people who were also signing up for Netflix to watch shows on Netflix. And you started to see just it was a good product. People liked using it. And some, sometimes that's all it really needs to be is that, is it a good product and do people like using it? Will they put their own money 
towards it again in the future? Will they talk about it with their friends unsolicited? And will they get that kind of growth? So I think right now, the I've, I've seen conversations around the, I, I don't know that there's like the meatless meat space. I think, I think one impossible is- Impossible Burger. Impossible Burger. And I think the other one is Beyond, beyond Meat. Right. Um, and it, it's too early to tell kind of uh, in terms of kind of you look at the financials, like how they're going to grow. And so I asked my friends who are vegetarians, which one tastes better? If I had to pick between those two, it would just be whatever is the better product. Now, it might take a long time for it to pay off. And once you go out far enough, then it's kind of now you're applying those good old fashioned buy and hold strategies. You might want to try a few of them and, and diversify. And so you start kind of feeling like a money manager instead of doing it for fun. But I don't think that you could beat a money manager using the same methods that the money managers use because they're going to put in more time and energy and expertise and skill. But I think it is possible that if you picked impossible meat or is it beyond meat? Did I, did I get that right? I, <laughs> Maybe I, they merge together. Yeah. I, I, it would not surprise me if one of those actually takes off. I have no idea which one, but I can see the future opportunity that if they have a good product, so I know one of them just partnered with Burger King, that if they have a legitimately tasty product, that's the kind of thing that can show significant growth that can make stocks fun to invest. And that that's, I had, saw enough people do that with um, Netflix, where it's like they liked using it. I also saw people doing this with Bitcoin. And here I advised all my clients and everyone I knew to avoid it because it's the difference between a company making more money in the future and a commodity or hold of value. With a Bitcoin or same, same idea with gold, it doesn't generate money. There's no revenues associated with that. All you're doing is hoping someone in the future will pay you more than you paid today. But with a company generating revenues, it is possible for those revenues to grow and that can see the stock, that can lead to stock price growth. So I'm okay with the idea, again, it's all the caveats are if you're taking care of all your goals, if you're taking care of retirement, uh, you're not gonna be destitute, your kids' college education is taken care of, all of those caveats. If there's something that you think is a great product or service that you like using, you would willingly put your money where your mouth is and buy this product or service. You're talking about it unsolicited. So you aren't, people aren't asking for tips. You're just like, I love this thing. Or you're hearing other people talk about that. That might be the opportunity to beat out a money manager over a long enough time frame. Because again, it goes back to that concentration that you're kind of putting all your eggs in one basket and you're going beyond what fundamental or technical analysis could show. Right. We mentioned the notion that money managers these days, if they're outperforming, there's a good chance it's luck. And what my mind says in this case with a retail investor who fits all your check boxes, if they end up outperforming, meaning they, they do better than what they would have otherwise, I feel like it'll likely be luck. Yeah, that's fair. That's a fair assessment. So in my mind, it's a different version of gambling, <laughs> which is fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But th there's a few things I, w I think it would behoove a retail investor to keep in mind if, if they're going down this route. First of all, I, I think it's important to consider that when somebody decides to manage their own money, there are a lot of behavioral biases that come into play. There's a lot of places where an individual can get tripped up. For example, there's this notion of overconfidence. Mm. 
the notion that, well, you know, I, I made a good play in Netflix before. Why can't I pick other stocks in this industry? I followed a simple algorithm or a simple heuristic in my mind. Like you said, I looked for a growth company. I liked the product. My friends were talking about it. I heard it on the news a few times. Well, you know, I, I can do this, right? And then the concern is that that might lead to more activity. You know, there's this mm -hmm. quote for, from Warren Buffett where he says, I'm going to paraphrase hopefully close enough, but the stock market is designed to transfer wealth from the active to the passive. The notion that the more you start trading around and trying to chase high flyers or move around your portfolio to the next biggest thing, the more likely you are to, to underperform. So, you know, that's just one example of dozens that uh, a, an investor would need to keep in mind if they're going down this road. And they're tricky, they're, they're counterintuitive, and they go against the core of how people typically think. But in the end, they end up hurting investors. So uh, I think keeping that part in mind. And then the other thing I'd keep in mind is the notion that everything has a price and that price is what the market says. This is the notion that markets are designed to come up with a fair price for things, including stocks. And the way this kind of works is, well, yeah, Netflix looks great. It's a great business. It looks like it's going to take off and a lot of people are going to jump in. There's plenty of room for growth, especially if you were talking a few years ago. But the question is, is that price worth it? Because that price could very well be too much. What okay. do I mean by that? Uh, yeah, well, go, go expand on that. Yeah, let, let me just expand on that so we're on the same page. For example, if everybody knows it's great and it's going to grow, they're willing to pay a lot more for it. That's going to drive the price of the stock up, meaning the stock has to grow that much more to make it a good buy. It has to grow maybe 10 times the size for it to be producing the same amount of earnings on a price basis as compared to uh, another stock that's not growing as quickly. And then the question comes down to, do I think this stock is not only going to grow, but is it going to surpass everybody's expectations? Meaning, is it going to surpass what people mm. think is a fair price? And th that's where things, I think, get tricky. It all comes down to, is the market right or wrong? And even if I don't think it's right, will it turn around when it should before I need to sell it? These are all tricky things to deal with. Okay, so I do think that one of the specific kind of words of warning and, or, or specific areas to apply caution is if the stock price is going up because there's a lot of kind of fever or investment behavior that's driving it up probably beyond what a fundamental or technical analysis should say. But in, the most common one you see is this, the PE ratio is getting really, really high. Uh, that's the, the price per earnings ratio. But, and that would theoretically indicate that it's overvalued or that might be what you're talking about where the company's making a certain amount of money. And so it's price, if it's 10 times earning might be a good deal, but if it's a hundred times earning, it's probably overpriced. And I, I'd agree with that. So I would advise against jumping in a rally that's already gone up. I, I, I kind of agree with that. So if it's already had a huge increase, don't think it's going to keep moving up beyond that. You've probably already missed out. That, that, that's, that's kind of, I, I see what you mean by the kind of the, the behavioral biases where you need to look for something that hasn't already gone up dramatically. Because if it has gone up a lot, it is probably more likely to come back to some middle ground than to continue up at the same rate. Right. What I feel like you're doing is it feels like you're developing a screen. So what I mean by that is what a professional investor might do is they might start with all of the stocks in a particular sector and they may start whittling them away. 
they might say, okay, this one has a high amount of growth and so does this one and this one, but these others don't. And then they may say, well, okay, which one has already had a good run? Well, okay, let's take away these few and now we're left with this set and so on. And once we whittle it down, okay, now let's just invest in these handful. And these are the ones that fit my profile. I, it, it's certainly something that one could do. <laughs> <laughs> I, and um, p- people have and do do that. Uh, I guess uh, maybe my sticking point is I feel like that may be fun, but I feel like it may not add value or it's unlikely to add value okay so another that kind of sw- quick small thing and then i kind of have my concluding point anytime you're considering trading you want to consider the cost of trading both actual commissions or trading costs and taxes associated with it that that's always going to be very important so if you're if you're too active just those costs of trading are probably going to eat into your return more than you realize because of those, if you're not aware of them and looking for them, it's very easy to miss those. But I think my biggest point is, are you doing this for fun? And if you're not having fun then, and you're just losing money, it's probably not going to be worth it. So think about your emotions before you go in. How will you feel when this stock goes down? It will go down at some point. How will you feel? Will that cause unnecessary stress and anxiety or regret? Will you feel worse when it goes down? And if that's the case, then you probably shouldn't be doing this at all. That you're making your life worse by trying to take on this new hobby. And if it's no longer enjoyable, then it's not worth it for you. Again, this is not money for goals. If you just want to kind of have fun, if it's not actually fun, because there will be downturns. And how do you emotionally handle that? And think about that in advance before you try to go down this this path. But if you find the experience enjoyable, kind of like the way gambling on sports can be enjoyable just watching a team that you're unaffiliated with if you find it enjoyable and you can handle that downturn then it might that experience part might be worth it the 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 opportunity cost or that underperformance might be kind of your entertainment budget for the it's like you you'd rather spend money whether it's kind of opportunity cost on picking stocks because it might turn out better than you expect. You could make money, but you're going in expecting to underperform by some amount. If you enjoy that more than going to the theater or buying a boat or different vacations, then I can see that being acceptable. But if you think that you have to make money on this and you start to get heartburn and feel stressed out at the first sign of a downturn, then you probably don't want to be doing this at all. And if you enjoy it and you start applying some of the screens or some of the technical analysis, fundamental analysis, then you start applying the same methods that a money manager is, then it, and you have a long-term time frame. is it still fun? And so maybe we're talking about just a, for most people, they either can't handle the downturns and they shouldn't be doing it. They need the money for a goal and they shouldn't be doing it. They don't want to underperform, so they shouldn't be doing it. So we might be just talking about a very small percentage of the population, even among retail investors, that most people shouldn't be doing it. But if you consciously think about these things in advance maybe it can be enjoyable i think i agree with that 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 makes sense it's part of what i mentioned before where people lie on a spectrum and there's certainly people who would fit the check boxes that you're saying 
there's certainly, for example, people who can gamble responsibly. Mm-hmm. There's certainly people who don't mind, you know, making a sports bet every now and then. I think the only thing I might counter with, and it sounds like you kind of covered this as well, is you don't want to get over your head. I think the tricky part with stocks is it's probably easier to oversee that opportunity cost because it doesn't really get tracked. It's not really something that shows up in your bank account. For example, you know, losing out to the S&P 2% over a lifetime on, you know, $10,000 is quite a bit, you know, it might be half your upside, but it's something that you may never notice. And hopefully highlighting that might help people think again. You know, these might be the same people who might be concerned about spending $10,000 at a casino. But, yeah. you know, that they've probably given up well over that amount over their lifetime in opportunity cost. Yeah. So it's something that I feel it's okay. Even maybe for some people, the, giving up the opportunity cost is still worth it. But I feel like maybe since it's so hidden, it's not explicit. It's something that gets overlooked when people make the decision to invest with money that they can even afford to not do well with. Okay. So, so maybe kind of like last time where we talked about, I would rather, when we talked about the fire movement, I'd rather someone saved 30% than 5%, but more likely there's a middle ground. In this case, it sounds like you're the people who might be able to do this responsibly and not feel the stress are probably kind of already wired to not go down this path in the first place. Whereas the people who find that excitement are more likely to go in too much and take on too many of those risks and possibly impact their lifestyle. I think that makes sense to me. As we mentioned, you could go down the route that professionals do and maybe that's overkill. But at least I think it makes sense to understand all of the different mistakes that people can get tripped up on before investing. But I get the feeling most people don't really dig into that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, maybe we'll cover a bunch of that over the next few episodes and so on. So maybe okay. we can help people be better gamblers. <laughs> so my final thought, I understood everything you said. I have the kind of skill. I don't buy any individual stocks. I invest for my long-term goals in diversified portfolio. And then when I have extra money that I want to use for an enjoyable experience, it's vacations. It's uh, going to a show. And so even if I, I think I could have that skill, it's not what I find enjoyable. So I don't own any individual stocks like that. Do you own any individual individual stocks? I, I do. So, you know, a little bit of my history, I used to trade around, I had a small partnership with some friends, um, you know, just as like an investment club. And my initial philosophy was to become a bottoms up fundamental investor that that's what i went to business school for and i I did some stints at hedge funds for for that very reason and i guess my mind has gravitated elsewhere as far as markets and investing go to be honest and what actually happened though is i do have some of those legacy positions it used to be my entire portfolio now it's a a small percent (laughs) But I think I keep it around as a reminder. Okay. A reminder of <laughs> what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> as you said, you know, I didn't lose money, <laughs> but I, I didn't do as well as I could have. And when I bought those stuff, I really tried to approach it from the standpoint of what would a professional do? I'm going to buy the stock because I've done all my research and it's going to be a great company. The market is going to grow. As Warren Buffett has once said, my favorite holding period is forever. Well, that's what I bought those (laughs) stocks for. And that's what they'll remind me for (laughs) ever. 
that maybe it's not the best thing to do with my time. Okay. Uh, I, I do like to kind of hear that, that you were truly a professional and even now you don't want to buy any new individual stocks. And I think that kind of, that feels about right. Yeah, that does seem like where people tend to gravitate who I've seen a lot in this industry. And in all honesty, it seems like a lot of re retail investors are, are moving towards this as well. Yep. Yep. Okay, so I think next time we'll get into uh, another topic related to money and finances and investing and planning and, and how people feel about that and, and, and kind of how do you incorporate that into your lifestyle, but how does that, how do we account for that spectrum? Because that seems to keep coming up each, each episode. So <laughs> I think that makes sense. That sounds like a good plan. Okay. Th thanks, Trisha. It was nice talking to you today. All right. Well, thanks, Aaron. Nice talking to you. And, and thanks, everybody, for listening out there. And also, if you liked what you heard, give us a like. We would appreciate that. And we'll talk to you guys again soon. All right, Aaron, take care. Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of the My Money Spectrum podcast. Be sure to visit mindmoneyspectrum.com to access the entire library of episodes. Remember, it's not black and white, but the wide spectrum of gray area where you get to pursue the freedoms you want in life. Opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical as no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested in directly. Have a nice day.